In this short video, we're going to take a look at what happens when we're asked to find the limit of a sequence, but we are not explicitly given the function that describes the sequence. For instance, in this example, we are asked to write an expression for the nth term of the sequence and then determine whether the sequence converges or diverges. So the problem here is that we are only given four values and we don't have some function or some expression that tells us how to find the nth term of the sequence. So that is what we'll have to do first and then we can do all of the things we've just learned how to do, which is then find the limit and determine if it converges or diverges. So keep in mind that this guy would be a sub one and a sub two and a sub three and a sub four. And there's different strategies for finding the pattern. But I can see, first of all, that this first term is positive and then negative and then positive and then negative. And so one of the things that I'm going to use is negative one to the nth. And this is actually going to be negative one to the n minus one. So we're always going to use negative one to some power if the sequence alternates like this. But you have to keep in mind whether or not this first value is positive or negative. So since my first value is positive, if I would have had negative one to the n, then negative one to the first would give me negative one and I need it to be positive. So I'm just going to use negative one to the n minus one. From here, now I need to take a look at the other part. So the other part is disregarding the positives and negatives. I have one, one fourth, one ninth, one sixteenth. And this looks like one over two squared, and this looks like one over three squared, and this looks like one over four squared, and I could write this as one over one squared. And so now I have to think about how could I write that in terms of n, where of course n here is one, and n here is two, and n here is three, and n here is four. So obviously this is going to be one over n squared. Now it's always a good idea to then double check, especially when you're dealing with one of these guys, because it's very easy to forget and put the wrong n or n minus one. So it's not a bad idea to just double check. Did I do this right? So let's just check a sub three negative one to the three minus one, one over three squared. Now I should end up with one ninth. So let's just make sure. Negative one to the three minus one is negative one squared. And then one over three squared is one ninth. Negative one squared is positive one. And one times one ninth is one ninth. So I feel pretty good. And again, I could check as many as I needed to, but I'm going to stop there. So I've done the first part, which said, write an expression for the nth term of the sequence. The second part says, and then determine whether the sequence converges or diverges. So now that I have this expression, I'm going to find the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n minus one, one over n squared. So finding the limit of this, again, I'm going to be thinking about what happens to each value. This guy is essentially one over a very, very, very large number because infinity squared is going to keep getting larger and larger and larger and larger. And so the fact that I've got this negative one to the n minus one, where obviously that's going to keep going back and forth from negative to positive, don't let that throw you off. This guy is certainly approaching zero because this is essentially one over infinity. And as that denominator gets larger, I am dividing by a larger number and getting zero. So this limit is in fact zero. Now again, I want to go back before we talk about converges and diverges because obviously this converges. Remember it converges if we have a limit and we do have a limit of zero. 
But I do want to talk about this guy because a lot of people get thrown off by that and say, well, how can it converge if it's going back and forth between positive and negative values? So if I think about graphing something like this, at 1, the value was 1, and at 2, the value was negative 1 fourth, and at 3, the value was positive 1 ninth, and at 4, the value is negative 1 16th. And so I can see that basically what's going to happen is it's going to just start getting very, very small. And that's why it makes sense that this converges to 0. Here's another example. This one is a little bit tougher, um, just because you're going to have to think back to some things you learned in Calculus 1, which is, of course, why I included it in this video, so that I could refresh your memory. So if you're feeling up to a challenge, press pause and try this one on your own. And if you're not feeling up to a challenge, then let's just get started together. So to begin, first we're going to write an expression for the nth term of the sequence. That is step one. So again, I'm going to take a look at what kind of pattern can I find. This two, I'm going to write as two over one because obviously these are all fractions. So as I'm thinking about a sub n, I'm going to have some expression in the numerator and some, in the, some other expression in the denominator. So focusing first at 2, 4, 8, 16, that appears to follow a pattern of 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third, 2 to the fourth, and since this guy is um, n equals 1, and this is n equals 2, and this is n equals 3, and this is n equals 4, it seems that I could write this as 2 to the n. So that's my numerator. In my denominator, again, keeping in mind I'm writing it using n. So looking at this pattern, obviously from 1 to 3 I increased by 2, from 3 to 5 I increased by 2, from 5 to 7 I increased by 2, so that tells me that I'm probably going to have 2 times n happening somewhere. Let me move that down. Uh, 2 times n. Now if I plug in 1, 2 times 1 is 2, but I need it to be 1. So how about 2 times n minus 1? So that's 2 times 1 minus 1 would be 2 minus 1, or 1. So that gives me my first value. 2n minus 1 for 2 would be, whoops, 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 1, which is 3. And so I feel pretty good about it that I have come up with the correct strategy, and that tells me that this guy is 2n minus 1. And again, you are welcome, before you get started on the second part of this question, to just choose a value at random, let's say a sub 3, and see, does that work? So 2 to the third times, or over 2 times 3 minus 1 would give me 8 over 6 minus 1, which is 5, and 8 fifths is in fact the third term. So that's step one is I've now written this sequence basically explicitly so that I could find each value using some function. Now I want to determine does the sequence converge or diverge? And if it converges, what's the limit? So I'm going to find the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 to the n over 2n minus 1. Again, direct substitution here would be a dumpster fire. You're just going to get 2 to the infinity and 2 times infinity. That's just a lot of infinities. And so I purposely threw this one in here, and this is why this one's more difficult, is I want us to think about some other strategies for finding limits when we can't find them by direct substitution. So we reviewed several in our last video. Um, but in this video, let's go ahead and take a look at 2 to the x over 2x minus 1. So again, just using that rule that says the limit of the function is the same as the limit of the sequence. So I'm just going to think about this as a function. The limit as x approaches infinity of 2 to the x over 2x minus 1. One of the strategies that we learned back in Calculus 1 said, that looks like an airplane instead of an arrow, 
said, what if you took the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator? Well, what is the derivative of two to the x? The derivative of two to the x is two to the x times the natural log of two. So that's helpful because now I'm only dealing with two to the x power. And in the denominator, I've got two x minus one. What's the derivative of two x minus one? It's just two. So that's super helpful because now I no longer have a two x in my denominator. I don't have an x in my denominator. So now what I'm doing is thinking about what's the limit of this function? Well, thinking about two to the infinity power, that means this guy in the numerator is approaching infinity. Natural log of two really doesn't affect us at all because I'm taking infinity times some value and then I'm dividing it by two, I'm still going to approach infinity. So because that function approaches infinity, then the limit of this sequence is also infinity, which means this guy diverges. So again, what rule did I use? This was L'Hopital's rule that says you can take the derivative of the numerator and denominator if you're not able to just use direct substitution. So that's another one of our strategies that we learned in Calculus 1. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at monotonic and bounded sequences.